Welcome back, Vela. Good to see you here. Sorry, just tweaking a few more things and letting the erase thing erase program finish on the uh, Sisyphus. Took a little longer than I thought it would. But this time my mic works. I actually didn't completely screw up and mute it in the uh, OBS software. So bonus. Thank you for catching that last stream. I really appreciate it. Start up the Sisyphus. Haven't tried this one yet. Let's try the circle pattern. All right. Well, you're here, so it's obviously bedtime, and I'm obvious. Thank you for, thank you for coming to join another stream. Uh, this time we're going to be starting a new novel. It'll be The Mysterious Affair at Styles by the wonderful Miss Agatha Christie. Uh, the House on the Borderlands will continue on Friday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for those of you who have been following that story. Um, I wanted to go ahead and thank everybody who has come out and followed and all the views I've gotten um, on the stories I've told so far. i got to say I'm, I'm blown away. We've had 50 plus viewers on one of the recordings and 40 something on the other. And people are starting to subscribe to the YouTube and that sort of thing as well. Honestly, I thought it would take much longer to get numbers like this. And yeah, they're small numbers compared to like the big streamers and that sort of thing. But at this point, it's still huge. So thank you, everyone. Uh, one note for the people who've been following along uh, but haven't followed yet, if you're enjoying the stories, please, please do sign in and follow. Twitch uh, uses metrics like number of followers and chat to gate some of the features that we can use to improve the stream and kind of add to the... Uh... <laughs> Thank you, Panda. Um, kind of add to the uh, value of the experience and things we can do, even basic stuff like moderators for chat is gated behind these metrics. So it's enormously important that we hit some of these early milestones so that we can unlock the full features for the stream. So please, 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 if you're enjoying it, you're following it, you're, re you're reading along, sign up for a Twitch account if you don't have one. They're free, it's super easy, and just click follow. It doesn't cost anything, super, super small commitment there. And on the bonus, It'll get you notifications of when stories go live and I upload new content that I recorded offline, that sort of thing. Well, I think we've given a few minutes for people to join. I suppose we should get started. I have not read this book in keeping with uh, my practice from the House on the Borderlands, so I will be discovering all of this right along with you. At about the hour mark, we'll take a short intermission, and then we'll return for the final hour of the stream. And we'll pick up whatever we do not finish next week at the same time slot on Wednesday. All right. Chapter 1. A Go to Styles. The, inten the intense interest aroused in the public by what was known at the time as the Styles case has now somewhat subsided. Nevertheless, in view of the worldwide notoriety which attended it, I have been asked, both by my friend Perot and the family themselves, to write an account of the whole story. This, we trust, will effectually silence the sensational rumors which still persist. I will therefore briefly set down the circumstances which led to my being connected with the affair. I had been invalided from home from the front, and, after spending some months in a rather depressing convalescent home, was given a month's sick leave. Having no near relations or friends, I was trying to make up my mind what to do when I ran across John Cavendish. I had seen very little of him for some years, 
Indeed, I had never known him particularly well. He was a good fifteen years my senior, for one thing, though he hardly looked his forty-five years. As a boy, though, I had often stayed at Stiles, his mother's place in Essex. We had a good yarn about old times, and it ended in his inviting me down to Stiles to spend my leave there. The mater will be delighted to see you again, after all those years, he added. Your mother keeps well, I asked. Oh, yes. I suppose you know she's married again. I'm afraid I showed my surprise rather plainly. Mrs. Cavendish, who had married John's father when he was a widower with two sons, had been a handsome woman of middle age as I remembered her. <laughs> Welcome, Grey Mouser. Thank you for joining us. Had been a handsome woman of middle age as I remembered her. She certainly could not be a day less than 70 now. I recalled her as an energetic, autocratic personality, somewhat inclined to charitable and social notoriety, with a fondness for opening bazaars and playing the Lady Bountiful. She was a most generous woman and possessed a considerable fortune of her own. Their country place, Stiles Court, had been purchased by Mr. Cavendish early in their married life. He had been completely under his wife's ascendancy, so much so that, on dying, he left the place to her <clears throat> for her lifetime, as well as the larger part of his income, an arrangement that was distinctly unfair to his two sons. Their stepmother, however, had always been most generous to them. Indeed, they were so young at the time of their father's remarriage that they always thought of her as their own mother. Lawrence, the younger, had been a delicate youth, he had qualified as a doctor, but early relinquished the profession of medicine, and lived at home while pursuing literary ambitions, though his verses never had any marked success. John practiced for some time as a barrister, but had finally settled down to the more congenial life of a country squire. He had married two years ago, and had taken his wife to live at Stiles, though I entertained a shrewd suspicion that he would have preferred his mother to increase his allowance, which would have enabled him to have a home of his own. Mrs. Cavendish, however, was a lady who liked to make her own plans and expected other people to fall in with them, and in this case, she certainly had the whip hand, namely the purse strings. <laughs> John noticed my surprise at the news of his mother's remarriage and smiled rather ruefully. Rotten little bounder, too, he said savagely. I can tell you, Hastings, it's making life jolly difficult for us. As for Evie, you remember Evie? No. Oh, I suppose she was after your time. She's the mater's factotum, companion, jack of all trades. A great sport, old Evie. Not precisely young and beautiful, but as game as they make them. You were going to say? Oh, this fellow. He turned up from nowhere on the pretext of being a second cousin or something of Evie's, though she didn't seem particularly keen to acknowledge the relationship. The fellow is an absolute outsider. Anyone can see that. He's got a great black beard and wears patent leather boots in all weathers. But the mater caught him to him at once. Took him on as a secretary. You know how she's always running a hundred societies. I nodded. Well, of course, the wars turned the hundreds into thousands. No doubt the fellow was very useful to her. But she could have knocked us all down with a feather when, three months ago, she suddenly announced that she and Alfred were engaged. The fellow must be at least twenty years younger than she is. It's simply barefaced fortune hunting. But there you are. She is her own mistress, and she's married him. It must be a difficult situation for you all. Difficult! It's damnable! Thus it came about, three days later. I descended from the train at Stiles St. Mary, an absurd little station, with no apparent reason for existence perched up in the midst of green fields and country lanes. John Cavendish was waiting on the platform and piloted me out to the car. Got a trop of tool of petrol still, you see, he remarked, mainly owing to the mater's activities. The village of Stiles St. Mary was situated about two miles from the little station, and Stiles Court lay a mile on the other side of it. It was a still warm day in early July. As one looked out over the flat Essex country, lying so green and peaceful under the afternoon sun. It seemed almost impossible to believe 
that not so very far away, a great war was running its appointed course. I felt I had suddenly strayed into another world. As we turned in at the lodge gates, John said, I'm afraid you'll find it quite very quiet down here, Hastings. My dear fellow, that's just what I want. Oh, it's pleasant enough if you want to lead the idle life. I drill with the volunteers twice a week and lend a hand at the farms. My wife works regularly on the land. She's up at five every morning to milk and keeps at it steadily until lunchtime. It's a jolly good life taking it all round, if it weren't for that fellow Alfred Inglethorpe. He chucked the car suddenly and glanced at his watch. I wonder if we've time to pick up Cynthia. No, no, she'll have started from the hospital by now. Cynthia, that's not your wife. No, Cynthia is a protege of my mother's, the daughter of an old schoolfellow of hers who married a rascally solicitor. He came a cropper and the girl was left an orphan and penniless. My mother came to the rescue and Cynthia has been with us nearly two years now. She works in the Red Cross Hospital at Tadminster, seven miles away. As he spoke the last words, we drew up in front of the fine old house. A lady in a stout tweed skirt, who was bending over a flower bed, straightened herself at our approach. Hello, Evie. Here's our wounded hero. Mr. Hastings? Miss Howard. Miss Howard shook hands with a hearty, almost painful grip. I had an impression of very blue eyes and a sunburnt face. She was a pleasant-looking woman of about forty, with a deep voice, almost manly in its stentorian tones, and had a large, sensible, square body, with feet to match these last encased in good, thick boots. Her conversation, I soon found, was couched in the telegraphic style. Weeds grow like house of fire. Can't keep even with them. So press you in. Better be careful. <laughs> I'm sure I shall be only too delighted to make myself useful, I responded. You guys are, uh, you guys are gonna make me lose my composure talking about being sus like it's among us. Clearly, there's not an imposter yet. We couldn't have met them this soon. <sighs> I'm sure I shall be only too delighted to make myself useful, I responded. Don't say it. Never does. Wish you hadn't later. You're a cynic, Evie, said John, laughing. Where's tea today? Inside or out? Out. Too fine a day to be cooped up in the house. Well, come on, then. You've done enough gardening for today. The laborer is worthy of his hire, you know. Come and be refreshed. Well, said Miss Howard, drawing off her gardening gloves, I'm inclined to agree with you. She led the way round the house to where tea was spread under the shade of a large sycamore. A figure rose from one of the basket chairs and came a few steps to meet us. <clears throat> my wife, Hastings, said John. I shall never forget my first sight of Mary Cavendish. Her tall, slender form outlined against the bright light, the vivid sense of slumbering fire that seemed to find expression only in those wonderful tawny eyes of hers, remarkable eyes, different from any other woman's that I have ever known, the intense power of stillness she possessed, which nevertheless conveyed the impression of a wild, untamed spirit in an exquisitely civilized body. All these things are burnt into my memory. I shall never forget them. She greeted me with a few words of pleasant welcome in a low, clear voice, and I sank into a basket chair, feeling distinctly glad that I had accepted John's invitation. Mrs. Cavendish gave me some tea, and her few quiet remarks heightened my first impression of her as a thoroughly fascinating woman. An appreciative listener is always stimulating, and I described, in a humorous manner, certain incidents of my convalescent home in a way which I flatter myself greatly amused my hostess. John, of course, good fellow though he is, could hardly be called a brilliant conversationalist. At that moment, a well-remembered voice floated through the open French window near at hand. Then you'll write to the princess after tea, Alfred? I'll write to Lady Tadminster for the second day myself. Or shall we wait until we hear from the princess? In case of a refusal, Lady Tadminster might open it the, s the first day, and Mrs. Crosby the second. Then there's the Duchess, about the school fete. There was a murmur of a man's voice, and then Mrs. Inglethorpe's rose in reply. Yes, certainly. After tea will do quite well. 
You're so thoughtful, Alfred, dear. Yeah, but this is Alfred if, uh, you know, he had married Mrs. Wayne after Mr. Wayne passed away. I'd say Alfred is certainly a bit sauce. The French window swung open a little wider, and a handsome, white-haired old lady with a somewhat masterful cast of features stepped out of it onto the lawn. A man followed her, a suggestion of deference in his manner. Mrs. Inglethorpe gre greeted me with effusion. Why, if, if it isn't too delightful to see you again, Mr. Hastings, after all these years. Alfred, darling, Mr. Hastings, my husband. I looked with some curiosity at Alfred, darling. He certainly struck a rather alien note. I did not wonder at John objecting to his beard. It was one of the longest and blackest I have ever seen. He wore a gold-rimmed pince-nez and had a curious impassive impassivity of feature. It struck me that he might look natural on a stage, but was strangely out of place in a real life. His voice was rather deep and unctuous. He placed a wood hand, wooden hand in mine and said, This is a pleasure, Mr. Hastings. Then turning to his wife, Emily, dearest, I think that cushion is a little damp. She beamed fondly on him as he substituted another with every demonstration of the tenderest care strange infatuation of an otherwise sensible woman. With the presence of Mr. Inglethorpe, a sense of constraint and veiled hostility seemed to settle down upon the company. Miss Howard, in particular, took no pains to conceal her feelings. Mrs. Inglethorpe, however, seemed to notice nothing unusual. Her volubility, which I remembered of old, had lost nothing in the intervening years, and she poured out a steady flood of conversation mainly on the subject of the forthcoming bazaar which she was organizing, and which was to take place shortly. Occasionally, she referred to her husband over a question of days or dates. His watchful and attentive manner never varied. From the very first, I took a firm and rooted dislike to him, and I flatter myself that my first judgments are usually fairly shrewd. Presently, Mrs. Inglethorpe turned to give some instructions about letters to Evelyn Howard, and her husband addressed me in his painstaking voice. Is soldiering your regular profession, Mr. Hastings? No. Before the war, I was in Lloyd's. You will return there after it is over? Perhaps. Either that or a, or a fresh start altogether. Mary Cavendish leaned forward. What would you really choose as a profession if you could just consult your inclination. Well, that depends. No secret hobby, she asked. Tell me. You're drawn to something. Everyone is. Usually something absurd. You'll laugh at me. She smiled. Perhaps. Well, I've always had a secret hankering to be a detective. The real thing? Scotland Yard? Or Sherlock Holmes? Oh, Sherlock Holmes, by all means. But really, seriously, I am awfully drawn to it. I came across a man in Belgium once, a very famous detective, and he quite inflamed me. He was a marvelous little fellow. He used to say that all good detective work was a mere matter of method. My system is based on his, though of course I have progressed rather further. He was a funny little man, a great dandy, but wonderfully clever. Like a good detective story myself, remarked Miss Howard. Lots of nonsense written, though. Criminal discovered in the last chapter. Everyone dumbfounded. Real crime, you'd know at once. There have been a great number of undiscovered crimes, I argued. Don't mean the police, but the, ple the people that are right in it. The family. You couldn't really hoodwink them. They'd know. Then, I said, much amused, you'd think if you were mixed up in a crime, say a murder, You'd be able to spot the murderer right off? Of course I should. Mightn't be able to prove it to a pack of lawyers, but I'm certain I'd know. I'd feel it in my fingertips if he came near me. It might be a she, I suggested. Might, but murder's a violent crime. Associate it more with a man. Not in a case of poisoning, Mrs. Cavendish's clear voice startled me. Dr. Bowerstein was saying yesterday that Owing to the general ignorance of the more uncommon poisons among the medical profession, there are probably countless cases of poisoning quite unsuspected. Why, Mary, 
What a gruesome conversation, cried Mrs. Inglethorpe. It makes me feel as if a goose were walking over my grave. Oh, there's Cynthia. A young girl in a VAD uniform ran lightly across the lawn. Why, Cynthia, you are late today. This is Mr. Hastings. This is Miss Murdoch. Cynthia Murdoch was a fresh-looking young creature, full of life and vigor. She tossed off her little VAD cap, and I admired the great loose waves of her auburn hair and the smallness and whiteness of the hand she held out to claim her tea. With dark eyes and eyelashes, eyelashes she would have been a beauty. She flung herself down on the ground beside John, and as I handed her a plate of sandwiches, she smiled up at me. Sit down here on the grass, do. It's ever so much nicer. I dropped down obediently. You work at Tadminster, don't you, Miss Murdoch? She nodded. For my sins. Well, do they bully, bully you, then? I asked, smiling. I should like to see them, cried Cynthia with dignity. I have got a cousin who is in nursing, I remarked, and she is terrified of sisters. I don't wonder. Sisters are, you know, Mr. Hastings. They simply are. You've no idea. But I'm not a nurse, thank heaven. I work in the dispensary. And how many people do you poison? I asked, smiling. smiling. Cynthia smiled, too. Oh, hundreds, she said. Cynthia, called Mrs. Inglethorpe. Do you think you could write a few notes for me? Certainly, Aunt, Am Aunt Emily. She jumped up promptly, and something in her manner reminded me that her position was a dependent one, and that Mrs. Inglethorpe, kind as she might be in the main, did not allow her to forget it. My hostess turned to me. John will show you to your room. Supper is at half past seven. We've given up late dinner for some time now. Lady Tadminster, our member's wife, she was the late Lord Abbotsbury's daughter, does the same. She agrees with me that one must set an example of economy. We are quite a war household. Nothing is wasted here. Every scrap of waste paper, even, is saved and sent away in sacks. I expressed my appreciation, and John took me into the house and up the broad staircase, which forked right and left halfway to different wings of the building. My room was in the left wing and looked out over the park. John left me. And a few minutes later, I saw him from my window, walking slowly across the grass, arm in arm with Cynthia Murdoch. I heard Mrs. Inglethorpe call Cynthia impatiently, and the girl started and ran back to the house. At the same moment, a man stepped out from the shadow of a tree and walked slowly in the same direction. He looked about forty, very dark with a melancholy, clean-shaven face. Some violent emotion seemed to be mastering him. He looked up at my window as he passed, and I recognized him, though he had changed much in the fifteen years that had elapsed since last we met. It was John's younger brother, Lawrence Cavendish. I wondered what it was that had brought that singular expression to his face. Then I dismissed him from my mind and returned to the contemplation of my own affairs. The evening passed pleasantly enough, and I dreamed that night of that enigmatical, enigmatical woman, Mary Cavendish. The next morning dawned bright and sunny, and I was full of the anticipation of a delightful visit. Yeah, he's super creeper, creeping on his buddy's wife. I did not see, although, gotta admit, his buddy seems to uh, be spending over much time with Miss Cynthia. I did not see Mrs. Cavendish until lunchtime, when she volunteered to take me for a walk, and we spent a charming afternoon roaming in the, cr in the woods returning to the house about five. As we entered the large hall, John beckoned us both into the smoking room. I saw at once by his face that something disturbing had occurred. We followed him in, and he shut the door after us. Look here, Mary. There's the deuce of a mess. Evie's had a row with Alfred Inglethorpe, and she's off. Evie? Off? John nodded gloomily. Nodded gloomily. Yes. You see, she went to the mater, and... Oh, here's Evie herself. Miss Howard entered. Her lips were set grimly together, and she carried a small suitcase. She looked excited and determined, and slightly on the defensive. At any rate, she burst out, I've spoken my mind. My dear Evelyn, cried Mrs. Cavendish, this can't be true. Miss Howard nodded grimly. True enough. 
afraid I said some things to Emily she won't forget or forgive in a hurry. Don't mind if they've only sunk in a bit. Probably water off a duck's back, though. I said right out, you're an old woman, Emily, and there's no fool like an old fool. The man's 20 years younger than you, and don't you fool yourself as to what he married you for. Money. Well, don't let him have too much of it. Farmer Rakes has got a very pretty young wife. Just ask your Alfred how much time he spends over there. She was very angry. Natural. I went on. I'm going to warn you, whether you like it or not. That man would as soon murder you in your bed as look at you. He's a bad lot. You can say what you like to me, but remember what I've told you. He's a bad lot. And what did she say? Miss Howard made an extremely expressive grimace. Darling Alfred, dearest Alfred, wicked calumnies, wicked lies, wicked woman to accuse her dear husband. The sooner I left her house, the better. So I'm off. Well, I think the issue is more that he might get tired of putting in the work and, you know, end the wife so he can inherit the money. So I'm off. But not now. This minute. For a moment, we sat and stared at her. Finally, John Cavendish, finding his persuasions of no avail, went off to look up the trains. His wife followed him, murmuring something about persuading Mrs. Inglethorpe to think better of it. As she left the room, Miss Howard's face changed. She leant toward me eagerly. Mr. Hastings, you're honest. I can trust you. I was a little startled. She laid her hand on my arm and sank her voice to a whisper. Look after her, Mr. Hastings. My poor Emily. There are a lot of sharks, all of them. Oh, I know what I'm talking about. There isn't one of them that's not hard up and trying to get money out of her. I've protected her as much as I could. Now I'm out of the way, they'll impose upon her. Of course, Miss Howard, I said. I'll do everything I can, but I'm sure you're excited and overwrought. She interrupted me by slowly shaking her forefinger. Young man, trust me. I've lived in the world rather longer than you have. All I ask is to keep your eyes open. You'll see what I mean. The throb of the motor came through the open window and Miss Howard rose and moved to the door. John's voice sounded outside. With her hand on the handle, she turned her head over her shoulder and beckoned to me. Above all, Mr. Hastings, watch that devil, her husband. There was no time for more. Miss Howard was swallowed up in an eager chorus of protests and goodbyes. The Inglethorpes did not appear. As the motor drove away, Mrs. Cavendish suddenly detached herself from the group and moved across the drive to the lawn to meet a tall, bearded man who had been evidently making for the house. The color rose in her cheeks as she held out her hand to him. Who is that? I asked sharply, for instinctively I distrusted the man. That's Dr. Bowerstein, said John shortly. And who is Dr. Bowerstein? He's staying in the village doing a rest cure after a bad nervous breakdown. He's a London specialist, a very clever man, one of the greatest living experts on poisons, I believe. And he's a great friend of Mary's, put in Cynthia, the irrepressible. John Cavendish frowned and changed the subject. Come for a stroll, Hastings. This has been a most rotten business. She always had a rough tongue, but there is no stauncher friend in England than Evelyn Howard. He took the path through the plantation, and we walked down to the village through the woods, which bordered one side of the estate. As we passed through one of the gates on our way home again, a pretty young woman of gypsy type coming in the opposite direction bowed and smiled. That's a pretty girl, I remarked appreciatively. John's face hardened. That is Mrs. Rakes. The one that Miss Howard... Exactly, said John, with rather unnecessary abruptness. I thought of the white-haired old lady in the big house, and that vivid, wicked little face that had just smiled into ours and a vague chill of foreboding crept over me. I brushed it aside. Styles is really a glorious old place, I said to John. He nodded rather gloomily. Yes, it's fine property. It'll be mine someday. Should be mine by now by rights, if my father had only made a decent will. And then I shouldn't be so damned hard up as I am now. 
Hard up, are you? My dear Hastings, I don't mind telling you that I'm at my wit's end for money. Couldn't your brother help you? Lawrence? He's gone through every penny he ever had, publishing rotten verses and fancy bitings. No, we're an impecunious lot. My mother's always been awfully good to us, I must say. That is, up to now. Since her marriage, of course. He broke off, frowning. I don't think they're using it euphemistically in this case. I think they're literally talking about poisons because uh, a few pages before that, they were talking about um, Dr. Bowerstein's comments on poisons and how most people didn't know about them. And so there were probably quite a few deaths due to poison that went unnoticed. <sighs> For the first time, I felt that with Evelyn Howard, something indefinable had gone from the atmosphere. Her presence had spelt security. Now that security was removed and the air seemed rife with suspicion. The sinister face of Dr. Bowerstein recurred to me unpleasantly. A vague suspicion of everyone and everything filled my mind. Just for a moment, I had a premonition of approaching evil. Chapter two, the 16th and 17th of July. I had arrived at Stiles on the 5th of July. I come now to the events of the 16th and 17th of that month. For the convenience of the reader, I will recapitulate the instance of those days in as exact a manner as possible. They were listed subsequently, <coughs> sorry, they were listed subsequ subsequently at the trial by a process of long and tedious cross-examinations. I received a letter from Evelyn Howard a couple days after her departure, telling me she was working as a nurse at the big hospital in Middle. Midlingham, a manufacturing town some 15 miles away, and begging me to let me know, let her know if Mrs. Inglethorpe should show any wish to be reconciled. The only fly in the ointment of my peaceful days was Mrs. Cavendish's extraordinary and, for my part, unaccountable preference for the society of Dr. Bowerstein. What she saw in the man I cannot imagine, but she was always asking him up to the house and often went off for long expeditions with him. I must confess that I was quite unable to see his attraction. I'm thinking it just means he's jealous of the attention that Bowerstein was getting. The 16th of July fell on a Monday. It was a day of turmoil. The famous bazaar had taken place on Saturday, and an entertainment in connection with the same charity, at which Mrs. Inglethorpe was to recite a war poem, was to be held that night. We were all busy during the morning, arranging and decorating the hall in the village where it was to take place. We had a late luncheon and spent the afternoon resting in the garden. I noticed that John's manner was somewhat unusual. He seemed very excited and restless. After tea, Mrs. Inglethorpe went to lie down to rest before her efforts in the evening, and I challenged Mary Cavendish to a single at tennis. About a quarter to seven, Mrs. Inglethorpe called us that we should be late as supper was early that night. We had rather a scramble to get ready in time, and before the meal was over, the motor was waiting at the door. The entertainment was a great success, Mrs. Inglethorpe's recitation receiving tremendous applause. There was also some tableau in which Cynthia took part. She did not return with us, having been asked to a supper party and to remain the night with some friends who had been acting with her in the tableau. The following morning, Mrs. Inglethorpe stayed in bed to breakfast, as she was rather overtired, but she appeared in her briskest mood about 12.30 and swept Lawrence and myself off to a luncheon party. Such a charming invitation from Mrs. Rolston, Lady Tadminster's sister, you know. The Rolstons came over with the Conqueror, one of our oldest families. Mary had excused herself on the plea of an engagement with Dr. Bowerstein. We had a pleasant luncheon, and as we drove away, Lawrence suggested that we'd re we should return by Tadminster, which was barely a mile out of our way, and pay a visit to Cynthia in her dispensary. Mrs. Inglethorpe replied that this was an excellent idea, but as she had several letters to write, she would drop us there, and we could come back with Cynthia in the pony trap. 
We were detained under suspicion by the hospital porter, until Cynthia appeared to vouch for us, looking very cool and sweet in her long white overall. She took us up to her sanctum and introduced us to her fellow dispenser, a rather awe-inspiring individual whom Cynthia, whom Cynthia cheerily addressed as Nibs. What a lot of bottles, I exclaimed, as my eye traveled around the small room. Do you really know what's in them all? Say something original, groaned Cynthia. Every single person who comes up here says that. We were really thinking of bestowing a prize on the first individual who does not say, what a lot of bottles. And I know the next thing you're going to say is, how many people have you poisoned? I pleaded guilty with a laugh. If you people only knew how fatally easy it is to poison someone by mistake, you wouldn't joke about it. Come on, let's have tea. We've got all sorts of secret stories in that cupboard. No, Lawrence, that's the poison cupboard. The big cupboard, that's right. We had a very cheery tea and assisted Cynthia to wash up afterwards. We had just put away the last teaspoon when a knock came at the door. The countenances of Cynthia and Nibs were suddenly petrified into a stern and forbidding expression. Come in, said Cynthia, in a sharp professional tone. A young and rather scared-looking nurse appeared with a bottle which she proffered to Nibs, who waved her towards Cynthia with the somewhat enigmatical re remark, I'm not really here today. Cynthia took the bottle and examined, examined it with the severity of a judge. This should have been sent up this morning. Sister's very sorry. She forgot. Sister should read the rules outside the door. I gathered from the little nurse's expression that there was not the least likelihood of her having the hardihood to retail this message to the dreaded sister. So now it can't be done until tomorrow, finished Cynthia. Don't, don't you think you could possibly let us have it t tonight? Well, said Cynthia graciously. We are very busy, but if we have time, it shall be done. The little nurse withdrew, and Cynthia promptly took a jar from the shelf, refilled the bottle, and placed it on the table outside the door. I laughed. Discipline must be maintained? Exactly. Come out on our little balcony. You can see all the outside wards there. I followed Cynthia and her friend, and they pointed out the different wards to me. Lawrence remained behind. But after a few moments, Cynthia called to him over her shoulder to come and join us. Then she looked at her watch. Nothing more to do, Nibs? No. All right, then we can lock up and go. I had seen Lawrence in quite a different light that afternoon. Compared to John, he was an astoundingly difficult person to get to know. He was the opposite of his brother in almost every respect, being unusually shy and reserved. Yet he had a certain charm of manner, and I fancied that, if one really knew him well, one could have a deep affection for him. I had always fancied that his manner to Cynthia was rather constrained, and that she, on her side, was inclined to be shy of him. But they were both gay enough this afternoon, and chattered together like a couple of children. As we drove through the village, I remembered that I wanted some stamps, so accordingly we pulled up at the post office. As I came out again, I cannoned into a little man who was just entering. I drew aside and apologized, when suddenly, with a loud exclamation, he clasped me in his arms and kissed me warmly. <clears throat> Mon ami Hastings, he cried. It is indeed Mon ami Hastings. Perot, I exclaimed. I turned to the pony trap. This is a very pleasant meeting for me, Miss Cynthia. This is my old friend, Monsieur Perot, whom I have not seen for years. Oh, we know Monsieur Perot, said Cynthia gaily, but I had no idea he was a friend of yours. Yes, indeed, said Perrault seriously. I know Mademoiselle Cynthia. It is by the charity of that good Mrs. Inglethorpe that I am here. Then as I looked at him inquiringly, Yes, my friend, she has kindly extended hospitality to seven of my country people who, alas, are refugees from their native land. We Belgians will always remember her with gratitude. Perrault was an extraordinarily, extraordinarily looking little man. He was hardly more than five feet four inches, <clears throat> but carried himself with great dignity. His head was exactly the shape of an egg, 
and he always perched it a little on one side. His mustache was very stiff and military. The neatness of his attire was almost incredible. I believe a speck of dust would have caused him more pain than a bullet wound. Yet this quaint, dandified little man, who, I was sorry to see, now limped badly, had been in his time one of the most celebrated members of the Belgian police. As a detective, his flair had been extraordinary, and he had achieved triumphs by unraveling some of the most baffling cases of the day. He pointed out to me the little house inhabited by him and his fellow Belgians, and I promised to go, see, go and see him at an early date. Then he raised his hat with a flourish to Cynthia, and we drove away. He's a dear little man, said Cynthia. I'd no idea you knew him. You've been entertaining a celebrity unawares, I replied. And for the rest of the way home, I recited to them the various exploits and triumphs of Hercule Perrault. We arrived back in a very cheerful mood. As we entered the hall, Mrs. Inglethorpe came out of her boudoir. She looked flushed and upset. Oh, it's you, she said. Is there anything the matter, Aunt Emily? asked Cynthia. Certainly not, said Mrs. Inglethorpe sharply. What should there be? Then catching sight of Dorcas, the parlor maid, going into the dining room, she called to her to bring some stamps into the boudoir. Yes, ma'am. The old servant hesitated, then added diffidently. Don't you think, ma'am, that you'd better get to bed? You're looking very tired. Perhaps you're right, Dorcas. Yes, no, not now. <clears throat> I have some letters that I must finish by post time. Have you lighted the fire in my room as I told you? Yes, ma'am. Then I'll go to bed directly after supper. She went into the she went into the boudoir again, and Cynthia stared after her. Goodness gracious, I wonder what's up, she said to Lawrence. He did not seem to have heard her, for without a word he turned on his heel and went out of the house. I suggested a quick game of tennis before supper, and, Cynthia agreeing, I ran upstairs to fetch my racket. Mrs. Cavendish was coming down the stairs. It may have been my fancy, but she, too, was looking awed and disturbed. <laughs> Dorcas, D-O-R-C-A-S. Not quite the same meaning. Had a good walk with Dr. Bauernstein, I asked, trying to appear as indifferent as I could. I didn't go, she replied abruptly. Where is Mrs. Inglethorpe? In the boudoir. Her, head cl her hand clenched itself on the banisters. Then she seemed to nerve herself for some encounter and went rapidly past me down the stairs, across the hall to the boudoir, the door of which she shut behind her. As I ran out to the tennis court a few moments later, I had to pass the open boudoir window and was unable to help overhearing the following scrap of dialogue. Mary Cavendish was saying in the voice of a woman desperately controlling herself, Then you won't show it to me? To which Mrs. Inglethorpe replied, My dear Mary, it has nothing to do with that matter. Then show it to me. I tell you that it is not what you imagine. It does not concern you in the least. To which Mary Cavendish replied with a rising bitterness, Of course, I might have known you would shield him. Cynthia was waiting for me and greeted me eagerly with, I say, there's been the most awful row. I've got it all out of Dorcas. What kind of row? Between Aunt Emily and him. I do hope she's found him out at last. Was Dorcas there then? Of course not. She happened to be near the door. It was a real old bust-up. I do wish I knew what it was all about. I thought of Mrs. Rake's gypsy face and Evelyn Howard's warnings, but widely, wisely decided to hold my peace, whilst Cynthia exhausted every possible hypothesis and cheerfully hoped Aunt Emily will send him away and will never speak to him again. Well, I'd say good old Alfred definitely has motive now. I was anxious to get hold of John, but he was nowhere to be seen. Evidently, something very momentous had occurred that afternoon. I tried to forget the few words I had overheard, but, do what I would, I could not dismiss them altogether from my mind. What was Mary Cavendish's concern in the matter? Mr. Inglethorpe was in the drawing room when I came down to supper. His face was 
as impassive as ever, and the strange unreality of the man struck me afresh. Mrs. Inglethorpe came down at last. She still looked agitated, and during the meal there was a somewhat constrained silence. Inglethorpe was unusually quiet. As a rule, he surrounded his wife with little attentions, placing a cushion at her back and altogether playing the part of the devoted husband. Immediately after supper, Mrs. Inglethorpe retired to her boudoir again. "'Send my coffee in here, Mary,' she called. "'I've just five minutes to catch the post.' Cynthia and I went and sat by the open window in the drawing room. Mary Cavendish brought our coffee to us. She seemed excited. Do you young people want lights, or do you enjoy the twilight, she asked. Will you take Mrs. Inglethorpe her coffee, Cynthia? I will pour it out. Do not trouble, Mary, said Inglethorpe. I will take it to Emily. He poured it out and went out of the room, carrying it carefully. Lawrence followed him, and Mrs. Cavendish sat down by us. We three sat for some time in silence. It was a glorious night, hot and still. Mrs. Cavendish fanned herself gently with a palm leaf. It's almost too hot, she murmured. We shall have a thunderstorm. Alas, that these harmonious moments can never endure. My paradise was rudely shattered by the sound of a well-known and heartily disliked voice in the hall. Dr. Bowerstein, exclaimed Cynthia. What a funny time to come. I glanced jealously at Mary Cavendish, but she seemed quite undisturbed. The delicate pallor of her cheeks did not vary. In a few moments, Alfred Inglethorpe had ushered the doctor in, the latter laughing and protesting that he was in no fit state for a drawing room. In truth, he presented a sorry spectacle, being literally plastered with mud. What have you been doing, doctor? cried Mrs. Cavendish. I must make my apologies, said the doctor. I did not really mean to come in, but Mr. Inglethorpe insisted. Well, Bowerstein, you are in a plight, said John, strolling in from the hall. Have some coffee and tell us what you've been up to. Thank you, I will. He laughed rather ruefully as he described how he had discovered a very rare species of fern in an inaccessible place, and in his efforts to obtain it, had lost his footing and slipped ignominiously into a neighboring pond. The sun soon dried me off, he added, but I'm afraid my appearance is very disreputable. At this juncture, Mrs. Inglethorpe called to Cynthia from the hall, and the girl ran out. Just carry up my dispatch case, will you, dear? I'm going to bed. The door into the hall was a wide one. I had risen when Cynthia did. John was close by me. There were therefore three witnesses who could swear that Mrs. Inglethorpe was carrying her coffee, as yet untasted, in her hand. My evening was utterly and entirely spoilt by the presence of Dr. Bowerstein. It seemed to me the man would never go. He rose at last, however, and I breathed a sigh of relief. I'll walk down to the village with you, Mr. said Mr. Inglethorpe. I must see our agent over those estate accounts. He turned to John. No one needs sit up. I will take the latch key. <laughs> All right, uh, let's take our intermission a little bit early as these are fairly lengthy chapters and I don't want to break mid-chapter. So let's pick this up again in five minutes. And I am going to finish my cup of tea.
It's only romance novel territory until somebody dies, though, right? Oh, and I see we got a new follower. Thank you, Random, for the follow. Greatly appreciate it. I hope everyone... <laughs> I do indeed. And I'm going to guess that it's going to be death by poison. I feel like there may have been a few hints or nods in that direction. So, is everyone enjoying it so far? This is uh, a different sort than the House on the Borderland, for sure. It's hilarious, Panda. All right. Everyone back? Ready to get back into it? Okay. So, Chapter Three. The night of the tragedy. I would say murder is definitely afoot. To make this part of my story clear, I append the following plan of the first floor of Styles. The servants' rooms are reached through the door B. They have no communication with the right wing, where the Inglethorpe's rooms were situated. It seemed to be the middle of the night when I was awakened by Lawrence Cavendish. He had a candle in his hand and the agitation of his face told me at once that something was seriously wrong. What's the matter, I asked, sitting up in bed and trying to collect my scattered thoughts. We are afraid my mother is very ill. She seems to be having some kind of fit. Unfortunately, she has locked herself in. I'll come at once. <clears throat> I sprang out of bed and, pulling on a dressing gown, followed Lawrence along the passage and the gallery to the right wing of the house. John Cavendish joined us, and one or two of the servants were standing round in a state of awe-stricken excitement. Lawrence turned to his brother. What do you think we had better do? Never, I thought, had his indecision of character been more apparent. John rattled the handle of Mrs. Inglethorpe's door violently, but with no effect. It was obviously locked or bolted on the inside. The whole of the household was aroused by now. The most alarming sounds were audible from the interior of the room. Clearly, something must be done. Try going through Mr. Inglethorpe's room, sir, cried Dorcas. Oh, the poor mistress! Suddenly I realized that Alfred Inglethorpe was not with us, that he alone had given no sign of his presence. John opened the door of his room. It was pitch dark, but Lawrence was following at the candle and by its feeble light we saw that the bed had not been slept in, and that there was no sign of the room having been occupied. We went straight to the connecting door. That, too, was locked or bolted on the inside. What was to be done? Oh, dear, sir, cried Dorcas, wringing her hands. Whatever shall we do? We must try and break the door in, I suppose. It'll be a tough job, though. Here. Let one of the maids go down and wake Bailey and tell him to go for Dr. Wilkins at once. Now then, we'll have a try at the door. Half a moment, though. Isn't there a door into Miss Cynthia's rooms? Yes, sir, but that's always bolted. It's never been undone. Well, we might just see. He ran rapidly down the corridor to Cynthia's room. Mary Cavendish was there, shaking the girl, who must have been an unusually sound sleeper, and trying to wake her. In a moment or two, he was back. No good. That's bolted, too. We must break in the door. I think this one is a shade less solid than the one in the passage. We strained and heaved together. The framework of the door was solid, and for a long time it resisted our efforts. But at last we felt it give beneath our weight, and finally, with a resounding crash, it was burst open. We stumbled in together, Lawrence still holding his candle. Mrs. Inglethorpe was lying on the bed, her whole form agitated by violent convulsions, in one of which she must have overturned the table beside her. As we entered, however, her limbs relaxed, 
and she fell back upon the pillows. John strode across the room and lit the gas. Turning to Annie, one of the housemaids, he sent her downstairs to lit to the dining room for brandy. Then he went across to his mother whilst I unbolted the door that gave on the corridor. I turned to Lawrence to suggest that I had better leave them now, that there was no further need of my services. But the words were frozen on my lips. Never have I seen such a ghastly look on any man's face. He was white as chalk. The candle he held in his shaking hand was sputtering onto the carpet, and his eyes, petrified with terror or some such kindred emotion, stared fixedly over my head at a point on the further wall. It was as though he had seen something that turned him to stone. I instinctively followed the direction of his eyes, but I could see nothing unusual. The still feebly flickering ashes in the grate and the row of prim ornaments on the mantelpiece were surely harmless enough. The violence of Mrs. Inglethorpe's attack seemed to be passing. She was able to speak in short gasps. Better now. V very sudden. Stupid of me to lock myself in. A shadow fell on the bed, and looking up, I saw Mary Cavendish standing near the door with her arm around Cynthia. She seemed to be supporting the girl, who looked utterly dazed and unlike herself. Her face was heavily flushed, and she yawned repeatedly. Poor Cynthia is quite frightened, said Mrs. Cavendish in a low, voice, low clear voice. She herself, I noticed, was dressed in her white land smock. Then, it must be later than I thought. I saw that a faint streak of daylight was showing through the curtains of the windows, and that the clock on the mantelpiece pointed to close upon five o'clock. A strangled cry from the bed startled me. A fresh access of pain seized the unfortunate old lady. The convulsions were of a violence terrible to behold. Everything was confusion. We thronged round her, powerless to help or alleviate. A final convulsion lifted her from the bed until she appeared to rest upon her head and her heels with her body arched in an extraordinary manner. In vain, Mary and John tried to administer more brandy. The moments flew. Again, the body arched itself in that peculiar fashion. At that moment, Dr. Bowerstein pushed his way authoritatively into the room. For one instant, he stopped dead, staring at the figure on the bed. And at the same instant, Mrs. Inglethorpe cried out in a strangled voice, her eyes fixed on the doctor. Alfred! Alfred! Then she fell back motionless on the pillows. With a stride, the doctor reached the bed and, seizing her arms, worked them energetically, applying what I knew to be artificial respiration. He issued a few sharp, short, sharp orders to the servants. An imperious wave of his hand drove us all to the door. We watched him, fascinated, though I think we all knew in our hearts that it was too late and that nothing could be done now. I could see by the expression on his face that he himself had little hope. Finally, he abandoned his task, shaking his head gravely. At that moment, we heard footsteps outside, and Dr. Wilkins, Mrs. Inglethorpe's own doctor, a portly, fussy little man, came bustling in. In a few words, Dr. Bowerstein explained how he had happened to be passing the lodge gates as the car came out, and had run up to the house as fast as he could, whilst the car went on to fetch Dr. Wilkins. With a faint gesture of the hand, he indicated the figure on the bed. Very sad, very sad, murmured Dr. Wilkins. Poor dear lady, always did far too much, far too much, against my advice. I warned her. Her heart was far from strong. Take it easy, I said to her. Take it easy. But no, her zeal for good works was too great. Nature rebelled. Nature rebelled. Dr. Bauernstein, I noticed, was watching the local doctor narrowly. He still kept his eyes fixed on him as he spoke. The convulsions were of a peculiar violence, Dr. Wilkins. I'm sorry you were not here in time to witness them. They were quite titanic in nature. Ah, said Dr. Wilkins wisely. I should like to speak to you in private, said Dr. Bauerstein. He turned to John. You do not object? Certainly not. We all trooped out into the corridor, leaving the two doctors alone, and I heard the key turned in the lock behind us. We went slowly down the stairs. 
I was violently excited. I have a certain talent for deduction, and Dr. Bowerstein's manner had started a flock of wild surmises in my mind. Mary Cavendish laid her hand upon my arm. What is it? Why did Dr. Powerstein seem so peculiar? I looked at her. Do you know what I think? What? Listen. I looked round. The others were out of earshot. I lowered my voice to a whisper. I believe she's been poisoned. I'm certain Dr. Bowerstein suspects it. What? She shrank against the wall, the pupils of her eyes dilating wildly. Then, with a sudden cry that startled me, she cried out, No! No! Not that! Not that! And, breaking from me, fled up the stairs. I followed her, afraid that she was going to faint. I found her leaning against the banisters, deadly pale. She waved me away impatiently. No, no, leave me. I'd rather be alone. Let me just be quiet for a minute or two. Go down to the others. I obeyed her reluctantly. John and Lawrence were in the dining room. I joined them. We were all silent. But I suppose I voiced the thoughts of us all when I at last broke it by saying, Where is Mr. Inglethorpe? John shook his head. He's not in the house. Our eyes met. Where was Alfred Inglethorpe? His absence was strange and inexplicable. I remembered Mrs. Inglethorpe's dying words. What lay beneath them? What more could she have told us if she had had time? At last, we heard the doctors descending the stairs. Dr. Wilkins was looking important and excited, and trying to conceal an inward exultation under a manner of decorous calm. Dr. Bowerstein remained in the background, his grave, bearded face unchanged. Dr. Wilkins was the spokesman for the two. He addressed himself to John. Mr. Cavendish, I should like your consent to a post-mortem. Is that necessary? asked John, gravely. A spasm of pain crossed his face. Absolutely, said Dr. Bowerstein. You mean by that that neither Dr. Wilkins nor myself could give a death certificate under the circumstances? John bent his head. In that case, I have no alternative but to agree. Thank you, said Dr. Wilkins briskly. We propose that it should take place tomorrow night, or rather, tonight. And he glanced at the daylight. Under the circumstances, I am afraid an inquest can hardly be avoided. These formalities are necessary, but I beg that you won't distress yourselves. There was a pause, and then Dr. Bowerstein drew two keys from his pocket and handed them to John. These are the keys of the two rooms. I have locked them, and, in my opinion, they would be better kept locked for the present. The doctors then departed. I had been turning over an idea in my head, and I felt that the moment had now come to broach it. Yet I was a little chary of doing so. John, I knew, had a horror of any kind of publicity, and was an easygoing optimist, who preferred never to meet trouble halfway. It might be difficult to convince him of the soundness of my plan. Lawrence, on the other hand, being less conventional and having more imagination, I felt I might count upon as an ally. There was no doubt that the moment had come for me to take the lead. John, I said, I am going to ask you something. Well, you remember my speaking of my friend Perrault, the Belgian who is here. He has been a most famous detective. Yes. I want you to let me call him in to investigate this matter. What? Now? Before the postmortem? Yes. Time is an advantage if, if there has been foul play. Rubbish, cried Lawrence angrily. In my opinion, the whole thing is a mare's nest of Bowerstein's. Wilkins hadn't an idea of such a thing until Bowerstein put it into his head. But like all specialists, Bowerstein's got a bee in his bonnet. Poisons are his hobby, so of course he sees them everywhere. I confess that I was surprised by Lawrence's attitude. He was so seldom vehement about anything. John hesitated. I can't feel as you do, Lawrence, he said at last. I'm inclined to give Hastings a free hand, though I should prefer to wait a bit. We don't want any unnecessary scandal. No, no, I cried eagerly. You need have no fear of that. 
Perot is discretion itself. Very well, then. Have it your own way. I leave it in your hands. Though, if it is as we suspect, it seems a clear enough case. God forgive me if I am wronging him. I looked at my watch. It was six o'clock. I was determined to lose no time. Five minutes delay, however, I allowed myself. I spent it in ransacking the library until I discovered a medical book which gave a description of strychnine poisoning. Why in the world would they have a book on strychnine poisoning? Anyway. Chapter 4. Perrault Investigates. The house which the Belgians occupied in the village was quite close to the park gates. One could save time by taking a narrow path through the long grass, which cut off the detours of the winding drive. So I accordingly went that way. I had nearly reached the lodge when my attention was arrested by the running figure of a man approaching me. It was Mr. Inglethorpe. Where had he been? How did he ex intend to explain his absence? He accosted me eagerly. My God! This is terrible! My poor wife! I have only just heard. Where have you been? I asked. Dinby kept me late last night. It was one o'clock before we'd finished. Then I found that I'd forgotten the latch key after all. I didn't want to arouse the household, so Dinby gave me a bed. How did you hear the news? I asked. Wilkins knocked Dinby up to tell him. My poor Emily! She was so self-sacrificing. Such a noble character. She overtaxed her strength. A wave of revulsion swept over me. What a consummate hypocrite the man was. I must hurry on, I said, thankful that he did not ask me whether I was bound. In a few minutes, I was knocking at the door of Leastway's cottage. Getting no answer, I repeated my summons impatiently. A window above me was cautiously opened, and Perrault himself looked out. He gave an exclamation of surprise at seeing me. In a few brief words, I explained the tragedy that had occurred, and that I wanted his help. Wait, my friend, I will let you in, and you shall recount to me the affair whilst I dress. In a few moments, he had unbarred the door, and I followed him up to his room. There, he installed me in a chair, and I related the whole story, keeping back nothing, and omitting no circumstance, however insignificant, whilst he himself made a careful and deliberate toilet. I told him of my awakening, of Mrs. Inglethorpe's dying words, of her husband's absence, of the quarrel the day before, of the scrap of conversation between Mary and her mother-in-law that I had overheard, of the former quarrel between Mrs. Inglethorpe and Evelyn Howard, and of the latter's innuendos. I was hardly as clear as I could wish. I repeated myself several times, and occasionally had to go back to some detail that I had forgotten. Perrault smiled kindly on me. The mind is confused, is it not so? Take time, mon ami. You are agitated, you are excited, it is but natural. Presently, when we are calmer, we will arrange the facts neatly, each in his proper place. We will examine and reject. Those of importance we will put on one side, those of no importance, poof! He screwed up his cherub-like face and puffed comically enough. Whew, blow them away. It's all very well, I objected, but how are you going to decide what is important and what isn't? That always seems like the difficulty to me. Perrault shook his head energetically. He was now arranging his mustache with exquisite care. Not so. Voyons. One fact leads to another, so we continue. Does the next fit in with that? A merveille. Good, we can proceed. This next little fact, no. Ah, that is curious. There's something missing. A link in the chain that is not there. We examine. We search. And that little curious fact, that possibly paltry little detail that will not tally, we put it here. He made an extravagant gesture with his hand. It is significant. It is tremendous. Y yes. Ah! Perrault shook his forefinger so fiercely at me that I quailed before it. Beware! Peril to the detective who says, It is so small, it does not matter. 
It will not agree. I will forget it. That way lies confusion. Everything matters. I know. You always told me that. That's why I've gone into all the details of this thing, whether they seem to me relevant or not. And I am pleased with you. You have a good memory, and you have given me the facts faithfully. Of the order in which you present them, I say nothing. Truly, it is deplorable. But I make allowances. You are upset. To that I attribute the circumstance that you have omitted one fact of paramount importance. What is that, I asked. You have not told me if Mrs. Inglethorpe ate well last night. I stared at him. Surely the war had affected the little man's brain. He was carefully engaged in brushing his coat before putting it on, and seemed wholly engrossed in the task. I don't remember, I said, and anyway, I don't see... You do not see? But it is of the first importance. I can't see why, I said, rather nettled. As far as I can remember, she didn't eat much. She was obviously upset, and it had taken her appetite away. That was only natural. Yes, said Perrault thoughtfully. It was only natural. He opened a drawer and took out a small despatch case, then turned to me. Now I am ready. We will proceed to the chateau and study matters on the spot. Excuse me, mon ami. You dressed in haste and your tie is on one side. Permit me. With a deft gesture, he rearranged it. Now, shall we start? We hurried up to the village and turned in at the lodge gates. Perrault stopped for a moment and gazed sorrowfully over the beautiful expanse of park, still glittering with morning dew. So beautiful, so beautiful, and yet the poor family, plunged in sorrow, prostrated with grief. He looked at me keenly as he spoke, and I was aware that I reddened under his prolonged gaze. Was the family prostrated by grief? Was the sorrow at Mrs. Inglethorpe's death so great? I realized that there was an emotional lack in the atmosphere. The dead woman had not the gift of commanding love. Her death was a shock and a distress, but she would not be passionately regretted. Perrault seemed to follow my thoughts. He nodded his head gravely. No, you are right, he said. It is not as though there was a blood tie. She had been kind and generous to those cabin dishes, but she was not their own mother. Blood tells. Always remember that. Blood tells. Perrault, I said. I wish you would tell me why you wanted to know if Mrs. Inglethorpe ate well last night. I have been turning it over in my mind. I can't see how it has anything to do with the matter. He was silent for a minute or two as we walked along, but finally he said, I do not mind telling you, though, as you know, it is not my habit to explain until the end is reached. The present contention is that Mrs. Inglethorpe died of strychnine poisoning, presumably administered in her coffee. Yes. Well, what time was the coffee served? About eight o'clock. Therefore, she drank it between then and half past eight, certainly not much later. Well, strychnine is a fairly rapid poison. Its effects would be felt very soon, probably in about an hour. Yet, in Mrs. Inglethorpe's case, the symptoms do not manifest themselves until five o'clock the next morning. Nine hours! But a heavy meal, taken at about the same time as the poison, might retard its effects, though hardly to that extent. Still, it is a possibility to be taken into account. But according to you, she ate very little for supper, and yet the symptoms do not develop until early the next morning. Now that is a curious circumstance, my friend. Something may arise at the autopsy to explain it. In the meantime, remember it. As we neared the house, John came out and met us. His face looked weary and haggard. This is a dreadful business, Monsieur Perrault, he said. Hastings has explained to you that we are anxious for no publicity. I comprehend perfectly. You see, it is only suspicion so far. We have nothing to go upon. Precisely. It is a matter of precaution only. John turned to me, taking out a cigarette case and lighting a cigarette as he did so. You know that fellow Inglethorpe is back? Yes, I met him. John flung the match into an adjacent flower bed, 
a proceeding which was too much for Perrault's feelings. He retrieved it and buried it neatly. It's jolly difficult to know how to treat him. That difficulty will not exist long, pronounced Perrault quietly. John looked puzzled, not quite understanding the portent of this cryptic saying. He handed the two keys which Dr. Bowerstein had given him to me. Show Monsieur Perrault everything he wants to see. The rooms are locked, asked Perrault. Dr. Bowerstein considered it advisable. Perrault nodded thoughtfully. Then he is very sure. Well, that simplifies matters for us. We went up together to the room of the tragedy. For convenience, I append a plan of the room and the principal articles of furniture in it. Perrault locked the door on the inside and proceeded to a minute inspection of the room. He darted from one object to the other with the agility of a grasshopper. I remained by the door, fearing to obliterate any clues. Perrault, however, did not seem grateful to me for my forbearance. What have you, my friend, he cried, that you remain there like, how do you say it? Ah, yes, the stuck pig. I explained that I was afraid of obliterating any footmarks. Footmarks? But what an idea. There's already been practically an army in the room. What footmarks are we likely to find? No. Come here and aid me in my search. I will put down my little case until I need it. He did so, on the round table by the window, but it was an ill-advised proceeding, for, the top of it being loose, it tilted up and precipitated the despatch case on the floor. Et voilà un table, cried Poirot. Ah, oh, my friend, one may live in a big house and yet have no comfort. After which piece of moralizing, he resumed his search. A small purple despatch case with a key in the lock on the writing table engaged his attention for some time. He took out the key from the lock and passed it to me to inspect. I saw nothing peculiar, however. It was an ordinary key of the Yale type with a bit of twisted wire through the handle. Next, he examined the framework of the door we had broken in, assuring himself that the bolt had really been shot. Then he went to the door opposite leading into Cynthia's room. That door was also bolted as I had stated. However, he went to the length of unbolting it and opening and shutting it several times. This he did with the utmost precaution against making any noise. Suddenly, something in the bolt itself seemed to rivet his attention. He examined it carefully and then, Nimbly whipping out a pair of small forceps from his case, he drew out some minute particle which he carefully sealed up in a tiny envelope. On the chest of drawers there was a tray with a spirit lamp and a small saucepan on it. A small quantity of a dark fluid remained in the saucepan, and an empty cup and saucer that had been drunk out of stood near it. I wondered how I could have been so unobservant as to overlook this. Here was a clue worth having. Perrault delicately dipped his finger into the liquid and tasted it gingerly. He made a grimace. Cocoa with, I think, rum in it. He passed on to the debris on the floor, where the table by the bed had been overturned. A reading lamp, some books, matches, a bunch of keys, and the crushed fragments of a coffee cup lay scattered about. Ah, this is curious, said Perrault. I must confess that I see nothing particularly curious about it. You do not? Observe the lamp. The chimney is broken in two places. They lie there as they fell. But see, the coffee cup is absolutely smashed to powder. Well, I said wearily, I suppose someone must have stepped on it. Exactly, said Perrault, in an awed voice. Someone stepped on it. He rose from his knees and walked slowly across to the mantelpiece, where he stood abstractedly fingering the ornaments and straightening them, a trick of, what, of his when he was agitated. Mon ami, he said, turning to me, somebody stepped on that cup, grinding it to powder, and the reason they did so was either because it contained strychnine or, which is far more serious, because it did not contain strychnine. I made no reply. I was bewildered, but I knew it was no good asking him to explain. In a moment or two, he roused himself and went on with his investigations. 
He picked up the bunch of keys from the floor and, twirling them round in his fingers, finally selected one, very bright and shining, which he tried in the lock of the purple dispatch case. It fitted, and he opened the box, but after a moment's hesitation, closed and relocked it, and slipped the bunch of keys, as well as the key that had originally stood in the lock, into his own pocket. I have no authority to go through these papers, but it should be done, at once. He then made a very careful examination of the drawers of the washstand. Crossing the room to the left-hand window, a round stain, hardly visible on the dark brown carpet, seemed to interest him particularly. He went down on his knees, examining it minutely, even going so far as to smell it. Finally, he poured a few drops of the cocoa into a test tube, sealing it up carefully. His next proceeding was to take out a little notebook. We have found in this room, he said, writing busily, six points of interest. Shall I enumerate them, or will you? Oh, you, I replied hastily. Very well, then. One, a coffee cup that has been ground into powder. Two, a dispatch case with a key in the lock. Three, a stain on the floor. That may have been done some time ago, I interrupted. No, for it is still perceptibly damp and smells of coffee. Four, a fragment of some dark green fabric, only a thread or two, but recognizable. Ah, I cried, that was what you sealed up in the envelope. Yes, it may turn out to be a piece of one of Mrs. Inglethorpe's own dresses, and quite unimportant. We shall see. Five, this... With a dramatic gesture, he pointed to a large splash of candle grease on the floor by the writing table. It must have been done since yesterday. Otherwise, a good housemaid would have at once removed it with blotting paper and a hot iron. One of my best hats once. But that is not to the point. It was very likely done last night. We were very agitated. Or perhaps Mrs. Inglethorpe herself dropped her candle. You only brought one or you brought only one candle into the room? Yes. Lawrence Cavendish was carrying it, but he was very upset. He seemed to see something over there, I indicated the mantelpiece, that absolutely paralyzed him. That is interesting, said Perrault quickly. Yet it is suggestive, his eye sweeping the whole length of the wall. But it was not his candle that made this great patch, for you perceive that this is white grease, whereas Monsieur Lawrence's candle which is still on the dressing table, is pink. On the other hand, Mrs. Inglethorpe had no candlestick in the room, only a reading lamp. Then, I said, what do you deduce? To which my friend only made a rather irritating reply, urging me to use my own natural faculties. And the sixth point, I asked, I suppose it is the sample of cocoa. No, said Poirot thoughtfully. I might have included that in the sixth, but I did not. No, the sixth point I will keep to myself for the present. He looked quickly round the room. There is nothing more to be done here, I think, unless... He stared earnestly and long at the dead ashes in the grate. The fire burns, and it destroys. But by chance there might be... Let us see. Deftly, on hands and knees... He began to sort the ashes from the grate into the fender, handling them with the greatest caution. Suddenly, he gave a faint exclamation. The forceps, Hastings! I quickly handed them to him, and with skill, he extracted a small piece of half-charred paper. There, mon ami, he cried. What do you think of that? I scrutinized the fragment. This is an exact reproduction of it. So it's a very small outline with two L's on the left-hand side, a space, and then the word and, and that's all that's shown on the image. I was puzzled. It was unusually thick, quite unlike ordinary notebook paper. Note paper. <laughs> well... I mean, for all Perot knows, Hastings is a suspect, so maybe he's t 
testing him and trying to eliminate him as a possibility. Suddenly, an idea struck me. Perot, I cried. This is a fragment of a will. Exactly. I looked up at him sharply. You are not surprised? No, he said gravely. I expected it. I relinquished the piece of paper and watched him put it away in his case with the same methodical care that he bestowed on everything. My brain was in a whirl. What was this complication of a will? Who had destroyed it? The person who had left the candle grease on the floor? Obviously. But how had anyone gained admission? All the doors had been bolted on the inside. Now, my friend, said Perrault br briskly, we will go. I should like to ask a few questions of the parlor maid. Dorcas, her name is, is it not? We passed through Alfred Inglethorpe's room, and Perrault delayed long enough to make a brief but fairly comprehensive examination of it. We went out through that door, locking both it and that of Mrs. Inglethorpe's room as before. I took him down to the boudoir, which he had expressed a wish to see, and went myself in search of Dorcas. When I returned with her, however, the boudoir was empty. Perrault, I cried, where are you? I am here, my friend. He had stepped outside the French window and was standing, apparently lost in admiration, before the various shaped flower beds. Admirable, he murmured. Admirable, what symmetry. Observe that crescent and those diamonds. Their neatness rejoices the eye. The spacing of the plants also is perfect. It has been recently done, is it not so? Yes, I believe they were at it yesterday afternoon. But come in, Dorcas is here. Eh bien, eh bien. Do not grudge me a moment's satisfaction of the eye. Yes, but this affair is more important. And how do you know that these fine begonias are not of equal importance? I shrugged my shoulders. There really was no arguing with him if he chose to take that line. You do not agree? But such things have been. Well, we will come in and interview the brave Dorcas. Dorcas was standing in the boudoir, her hands folded in front of her, and her gray hair rose in stiff waves under her white cap. She was the very model and picture of a good, old-fashioned servant. In her attitude towards Perrault, she was inclined to be suspicious, but he soon broke down her defenses. He drew a ch forward a chair. Pray be seated, mademoiselle. Thank you, sir. You have been with your mistress many years, is it not so? Ten years, sir. That is a long time, and very faithful service. You were much attached to her, were you not? She was a very good mistress to me, sir. Then you will not object to answering a few questions. I put them to you with Mr. Cavendish's full approval. Oh, certainly, sir. Then I will begin by asking you about the events of yesterday afternoon. Your mistress had a quarrel? Yes, sir, but I don't know that I ought... Dorcas hesitated. Perrault looked at her keenly. My good Dorcas, it is necessary that I should know every detail of that quarrel as fully as possible. Do not think that you are betraying your mistress's secrets. Your mistress lies dead, and it is necessary that we should know all if we are to avenge her. Nothing can bring her back to life, but we do hope if there has been foul play, to bring the murderer to justice. Amen to that, said Dorcas fiercely. And, naming no names, there's one in this house that none of us could ever abide. And an ill day it was when first he darkened the threshold. Perrault waited for her indignation to subside. And then, resuming his business-like tone, he asked, Now, as to this quarrel, what is the first you heard of it? Well, sir, I happened to be going along the hall outside yesterday. What time was that? I couldn't say, sir, but it wasn't tea time by a long way. Perhaps four o'clock, or it may have been a bit later. Well, sir, as I said, I happened to be passing along when I heard voices very loud and angry in here. 
I didn't exactly mean to listen, but, well, there it is. I stopped. The door was shut, but the mistress was speaking very sharp and clear, and I heard what she said quite plainly. You have lied to me and deceived me, she said. I didn't hear what Mr. Inglethorpe replied. He spoke a good bit lower than she did, but she answered, How dare you? I have kept you and clothed you and fed you. You owe everything to me. And this is how you repay me? By bringing disgrace upon our name? Again, I didn't hear what he said, but she went on. Nothing that you can say will make any difference. I see my duty clearly. My mind is made up. You need not think that any fear of publicity or scandal between a husband and wife will deter me. Then I thought I heard them coming out, so I went off quickly. You are sure it was Mr. Inglethorpe's voice you heard? Oh, yes, sir. Who else's could it be? Well, what happened next? Later, I came back to the hall, but it was all quiet. At five o'clock, Mrs. Inglethorpe rang the bell and told me to bring her a cup of tea, nothing to eat, to the boudoir. She was looking dreadful, so white and upset. <laughs> Dorcas, she says, I've had a great shock. I'm sorry for that, mum, I says. You'll feel better after a nice hot cup of tea, mum. She had something in her hand. I don't know if it was a letter or just a piece of paper, but it had writing on it, and she kept staring at it, almost as if she couldn't believe what was written there. She whispered to herself as though she had forgotten I was there. These few words, and everything's changed. And then she says to me, Never trust a man, Dorcas. They're not worth it. I hurried off and got her a good strong cup of tea. And she thanked me. And said she'd feel better when she'd drunk it. I don't know what to do, she says. Scandal between husband and wife is a dreadful thing, Dorcas. I'd rather hush it up if I could. Mrs. Cavendish came in just then, so she didn't say any more. She still had the letter, or whatever it was, in her hand? Yes, sir. What would she be likely to do with it afterwards? Well, I don't know, sir, except I expect she would lock it in that purple case of hers. Ah, uh, I don't know. I think poor Cynthia was drugged with the sleeping draft to keep her out of the way. Is that where she usually kept important papers? Yes, sir. She brought it down with her every morning and took it up every night. When did she lose the key of it? She missed it yesterday at lunchtime, sir, and told me to look carefully for it. She was very much put out about it. But she had a duplicate key? Oh, yes, sir. Dorcas was looking very curiously at him, and to tell the truth, so was I. What was all this about a lost key? Perot smiled. Never mind, Dorcas. It is my business to know things. Is this the key that was lost? He drew from his pocket the key that he had found in the, in the lock of the dispatch case upstairs. Dorcas' eyes looked as though they would pop out of her head. That's it, sir. Right enough. But where did you find it? I looked everywhere for it. Ah, but you see it was not in the same place yesterday as it was today. Now, to pass to another subject... Had your mistress a dark green dress in her wardrobe? Dorcas was rather startled by the unexpected question. No, sir. Are you quite sure? Oh, yes, sir. Has anyone else in the house got a green dress? Dorcas reflected. Miss Cynthia has a green evening dress. Light or dark green? A light green, sir. A sort of chiffon, they call it. Ah, that is not what I want. And nobody else says anything green? No, sir. Not that I know of. Perot's face did not betray a trace of whatever, whether he was disappointed or otherwise. He merely remarked, Good. We will leave that and pass on. Have you any reason to believe that your mistress was likely to take a sleeping powder last night? Not last night, sir. I know she didn't. Why do you, re why do you know so positively? because the box was empty. 
She took the last one two days ago, and she didn't have any more made up. You're quite sure of that? Positive, sir. Then that is cleared up. By the way, your mistress didn't ask you to sign any paper yesterday. To sign a paper? No, sir. When Mr. Hastings and Mr. Lawrence came in yesterday evening, they found your mistress busy writing letters. I suppose you can give me no idea to whom these letters were addressed. I'm afraid I couldn't, sir. I was out in the evening. Perhaps Annie could tell you, though she's a careless girl. Never cleared the coffee cups away last night. That's what happens when I'm not here to look after things. Perrault lifted his hand. Since they have been left, Dorcas, leave them a little longer, I pray you. I should like to examine them. Very well, sir. What time did you go out last evening? About six o'clock, sir. Thank you, Dorcas. That is all I have to ask you. He rose and strolled to the window. I have been admiring these flower beds. How many gardeners are employed here, by the way? Only three now, sir. Five we had before the war, when it was kept as a gentleman's place should be. I wish you could have seen it then, sir. A fair sight it was. But now there's only old Manning and young William, and a new-fashioned woman gardener in breeches and such like. Ah, these are dreadful times. The good times will come again, Dorcas. At least, we hope so. Now, will you send Annie to me here? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. How did you know that Mrs. Inglethorpe took sleeping powders, I asked, in lively curiosity, as Dorcas left the room, and about the lost key and the duplicate? One thing at a time. As to the sleeping powders, I knew by this. He suddenly produced a small cardboard box, such as chemists use for powders. Where did you find it? In the washstand drawer in Mrs. Inglethorpe's bedroom. It was number six of my catalog. But I suppose, as the last powder was taken two days ago, it is not of much importance. Probably not. But do you notice anything that strikes you as peculiar about this box? I examined it closely. No, I can't say that I do. Look at the label. I read the label carefully. One powder to be taken at bedtime, if required. Mrs. Inglethorpe. No, I see nothing unusual. Not the fact that there is no chemist's name? Ah, I exclaimed. To be sure, that is odd. Have you ever known a chemist to send out a box like that without his printed name? No, I can't say that I have. I was becoming quite excited, but Perrault dampened my ardor by remarking, Yet the explanation is quite simple, so do not intrigue yourself, my friend. An audible creaking proclaimed the, the approach of Annie, so I had no time to reply. Annie was a fine, strapping girl, and was evidently laboring under intense excitement, mingled with a certain ghoulish enjoyment of the tragedy. Well, she's kind of a chitty person. Perot came to the point at once, with a businesslike briskness. I sent for you, Annie, because I thought you might be able to tell me something about the letters Mrs. Inglethorpe wrote last night. How many were there, and can you tell me any of the names and addresses? Annie considered. There are four letters, sir. One was to Miss Howard, and one was to Mr. Wells, the lawyer, and the other to... I don't remember, sir. Oh, yes! One was to Ross's, the caterers in Tadminster. The other one... I don't remember. Think, urged Perot. Annie racked her brains in vain. I'm sorry, sir. But it's clean gone. I don't think I can have noticed it. It does not matter, said Perot, not betraying any sign of disappointment. Now, I want to ask you about something else. There's a saucepan in Mrs. Mrs. Inglethorpe's room with some cocoa in it. Did she have that every night? Yes, sir. It was put in her room every evening, and she warmed it up in the night, whenever she fancied it. What was it? Plain cocoa? 
Yes, sir. Made with milk with a teaspoonful of sugar and two teaspoonfuls of rum in it. Who took it to a room? I did, sir. Always? Yes, sir. At what time? When I went to draw the curtains as a rule, sir. Did you bring it straight up from the kitchen then? No, sir. You see, there's not much room on the gas stove. So cook used to make it early, before putting the vegetables on for supper. Then I used to bring it up, and I put it on the table by the swing door, and take it into a room later. The swing door is in the left wing, is it not? Yes, sir. And the table, it is on this side of the door, or on the farther servant side. It's this side, sir. What time did you bring it up last night? About quarter past seven, I should say, sir. And when did you take it into Mrs. Inglethorpe's room? When I went to shut up, sir. About eight o'clock, Mrs. Inglethorpe came up to bed before I had finished. Then, between 7.15 and eight o'clock, the cocoa was standing on the table in the left wing? Yes, sir. Annie had been growing redder and redder in the face, and now she blurted out unexpectedly. And if there was salt in it, sir, it wasn't me. I never took salt near it. What makes you think there was salt in it? asked Perrault. Seeing it on the tray, sir. You saw some salt on the tray? Yes, coarse kitchen salt it looked. I never noticed it when I took the tray up, but when I came to take it into the mistress's room, I saw it at once, and I suppose I ought to have taken it down again and asked Cook to make some fresh. But I was in a hurry because Dorcas was out, and I thought maybe the cocoa itself was all right and the salt had only gone on the tray. So I dusted it off with my apron and took it in. I had the utmost difficulty in controlling my excitement. Unknown to herself, Annie had provided us with an important piece of evidence. How she would have gaped if she had realized that her coarse kitchen salt was strychnine, one of the most deadly poisons known to mankind. I marveled at Poirot's calm. His self-control was astonishing. I awaited his next question with impatience, but it disappointed me. When you went into Mrs. Inglethorpe's room, was the door leading into Miss Cynthia's room bolted? Oh, yes, sir, it always was. It had never been opened. And the door into Mr. Inglethorpe's room, did you notice if that was bolted too? Annie hesitated. I couldn't rightly say, sir. It was shut, but I couldn't say whether it was bolted or not. When you finally left the room, did Mrs. Inglethorpe bolt the door after you? No, sir, not then, but I expect she did later. She usually did lock it at night. The door into the passage, that is. Did you notice any candle grease on the floor when you did the room yesterday? Candle grease? Oh, no, sir. Mrs. Inglethorpe didn't have a candle, only a reading lamp. Then if there had been a large patch of candle grease on the floor, you think you would have been sure to have seen it? Yes, sir. And I would have taken it out with a piece of blotting paper and a hot iron. Then Perrault repeated the question he had put to Dorcas. Did your mistress ever have a green dress? No, sir. Nor a mantle, nor a cape, nor a, how do you call it, a sports coat. Not green, sir. Nor anyone else in the house? Annie reflected. No, sir. You're sure of that? Quite sure. Bien, that is all I would to know. Thank you very much. With a nervous giggle, <laughs> Annie took herself creakingly out of the room. My pent-up excitement burst forth. Perot, I cried, I congratulate you. This is a great discovery. What is a great discovery? Why, that it was the cocoa and not the coffee that was poisoned. That explains everything. Of course it did not take effect until the early morning, since the cocoa was only drunk in the middle of the night. So you think that the cocoa, mark well what I say, Hastings, the Cocoa contains strychnine. Of course, that salt on the tray. What else could it have been? It might have been salt, replied Perrault placidly. I shrugged my shoulders. If he was going to take the matter that way, it was no good arguing with him. The idea crossed my mind, not for the first time, that poor old Perrault was growing old. Privately, I thought it lucky that he had associated with him someone of more receptive type of mind. Perrault was surveying me with quietly twinkling eyes. You are not pleased with me, mon ami? 
My dear Perrault, I said coldly, it is not for me to dictate to you. You have a right to your own opinion, just as I have to mine. A most admirable sentiment, remarked Perrault, rising briskly to his feet. Now I've finished with this room. By the way, whose is the smaller desk in the corner? I gotta say that uh, that mon ami that he said there sounded a whole lot like, uh, you're not happy with me, young blood? <clears throat> Mr. Inglethorpe's. <laughs> ah, he tried the roll top tentatively, locked, but perhaps one of Mrs. Inglethorpe's keys would open it. Are you guys plotting to kill me in chat? Not cool. But yeah, I do play Among Us and uh, we could probably set up a game with followers or subscribers at some point. I think that'd be cool. Might even stream it if you wanted. And, you know, we'll know that random is sus as hell. He tried the roll top tentatively. Locked. But perhaps one of Mrs. Inglethorpe's keys would open it. He tried several, twisting and turning them with a practiced hand, and finally uttering an ejaculation of satisfaction. Voila! It is not the key, but it will open it at a pinch. He slid back the roll top and ran a rapid eye over the neatly filed papers. To my surprise, he did not examine them, merely remarking approvingly as he relocked the desk. Decidedly, he is a man of method, this Mr. Inglethorpe. A man of method was, in Perrault's estimation, the highest praise that could be bestowed on any individual. I felt that my friend was not what he had been as he rambled on disconnectedly. There were no stamps in his desk, but there might have been a eh, mon ami? There might have been. Yes. His eyes wandered round the room. This boudoir has nothing more to tell us. It did not yield much. Only this. <laughs> he pulled a crumpled envelope out of his pocket and tossed it over to me. It was a rather curious document. A plain, dirty-looking old envelope with a few words scrawled across it apparently at random. The following is a facsimile of it. Uh, it looks like he's written the word possessed, and then I am possessed, he is possessed, I am possessed, and possessed. A bit randomly. And I think we will close there. Um, that's the end of the chapter. And we will pick up again next Wednesday with chapter five. It isn't strychnine, is it? So, everybody enjoy the book so far? Glad to hear it. All right. Well, hopefully I will see all of you for the stream on Friday. It'll be 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And we'll be picking up with, I think it was chapter 19 of The House on the Borderland by William Hope Hodgson. If any of you listening have not already uh, checked that out, the previous two streams are uploaded on Twitch and YouTube, both available there for you to catch up. Uh, it's about four hours of reading or so, four and a half. Um, anyway, hope to see you soon. Thank you again for joining us and have an excellent evening.